Robert E. Lee once said, I cannot trust a man to control others who cannot control himself. This represents his stance in the aftermath of the war, as his belief was that the war was not needed if both sides used moral to solve the issues that were at hand. Robert E. Lee, a traitor to the Union and a loyal servant to the South. A documentary about the Civil War General, Robert E. Lee, done by Pete Jordan Aides, Lucas Livingood, Sean Parikh, and Clay Washington. It says in this quote, The war, an unnecessary condition of affairs that might have been avoided if forbearance and wisdom had been practiced on both sides. This represents Lee's stance after the war, but his stance changes as the war goes on. Robert E. Lee's Childhood and Early Life Lee's family was one of the first Virginia families and arrived from their native country in the 1600s. Robert E. Lee was born January 19, 1807 on the Stratford Hall Plantation in Westmoreland County, Virginia. Lee was born the son of Colonel Henry Lee III and mother Anne Hill Lee. Lee's father was a tobacco farmer and had been poor due to investment failures. Lee and his father didn't get along well, and before he was a farmer, his father had been a cavalry leader in the Revolution. Lee's father died when he was just 11 years old, leaving the stress of seven children to his wife. Lee was a leader in his family and remained close to his mother, helping her to maintain the household throughout his childhood. He always had more work to do after completing tasks as a child, so he learned to excel in everything he did. This hardworking spirit translated into his determination to succeed later in his life. Then, in 1809, Lee's family moved to Alexandria, Virginia because of the better schooling system that was provided there. Lee was not happy with his childhood and was happy to leave when he entered West Point in the middle of the year in 1825. The focus of the school, or Army Training Center, was engineering, and the rules of the college were very rigorous. The members of the school were not allowed to leave the college until they had completed at least two years of schooling. The students were rarely allowed off campus and had to work very hard in order to pass. Lee finished second in his class, only to Charles Mason. Lee's election as general. Lee first proved his worth in the Mexican War by being a high-ranking captain on the team of General Winfield Scott. At the start of the Civil War, Robert E. Lee was asked by the head of the Union, Abraham Lincoln, to be the leader of the Union Army. This very prestigious position was very much tempting to the high-ranking officer. However, Lee could not bear fighting against his home state of Virginia, so he turned down the position offered to him by the influential man. Lee was then a high-ranking officer in the Confederate Army, but not the general. After the wounding of Joseph E. Johnston, the leader of the Confederate Army, Robert E. Lee gained control of the entire Army of Northern Virginia. His success as the leader of the Northern Virginia Army translated into him advancing in the hierarchy of the Confederate Army. The Civil War The start of the Civil War went very well for Lee in the Army of Northern Virginia. He won his first battle within the war, which was called the Seven Days War. He also succeeded in some other skirmishes early in the war. However, Lee didn't have all success. When he tried to traverse the Potomac River, he failed miserably. Crossing the river after the fight that was later called the Antietam, combined with the battle itself, lost him 14,000 men. Lee continued to win and lose some battles. In one such battle, Lee was outnumbered 2 to 1, and he took a major risk. Lee surrounded the enemy and successfully converged on them. Other risks like this won him some battles, and he rebounded from the losses for a short time. However, even though Lee was still winning some battles, it was becoming more and more difficult for him to win against the Union Army. In July 1863, Lee lost the Battle of Gettysburg and had to terminate his t attempts at taking the North for the Confederacy. Lee's top men were also losing battles that he could usually rely on them to win. Then, just when victory seemed very unlikely for Lee, the North appointed a new general, General Ulysses S. Grant. Although Lee was a more seasoned fighter, Grant had Lee beat in men, weapons, horses, etc. Grant couldn't outwit Lee, and even though Grant had more resources, he still suffered heavy losses. However, Grant's numbers were quickly restored by new, young men who were hungry to fight. As Grant was gaining men, Lee's health was declining, and his men were losing morale. The war was greatly shifting in Grant's favor and showed no signs of stopping. Lee was hopeless enough that he even sent a letter to his sister regarding how deep of a hole he had dug his army into. He says, Now we are in a state of war that will yield to nothing. Lee's running army then decided to defend cities, and it was only a matter of time before his ranks were overwhelmed by the far superior forces of Grant. Lee surrendered at Appomattox Courthouse on April 9, 1865. The war was finally over.
So he finally addressed his men and told them that surrender was the only reasonable course of action. Post-war life. Lee was greatly affected by the war and couldn't continue his life normally after it was over. He found it hard to cope with the fact that for the first time in his life, he failed. Lee was also still suffering from heart disease and his condition was worsening. Apart from his health factors, he also became president of Washington College. Although he was a general, he proved to be a great professor, lifting his student spirits in the efforts of rebuilding a united nation. Then, on September 28, 1870, Robert E. Lee endured a stroke. Finally, on October 12, 1870, Lee died from a heart attack at his home in Lexington, Virginia. Although Lee failed the South by losing the war, he did have some notable performances that deserve to be acknowledged even today. One such victory is still revered as one of the most successful maneuvers in military history. In this battle, the Army of Northern Virginia sought to seize Chancellorsville from the Union. Lee decided to use his troops to encircle Chancellorsville rather than keeping his troops as a single unit. This was a major risk because he was already outnumbered two to one, and spreading his troops out could be perilous. However, Lee's military expertise allowed for him to successfully take the town. Another major victory of Lee's was at the Second Battle of Bull Run. Here, Lee defended Confederate territory by flanking the enemy and successfully keeping the North away using his aptitude for military strategy. This was also the part of the war when the North changed from attacking the South to defending their own land, which provided the Confederacy with an amazing opportunity to defeat the enemy. Even though Lee succeeded in some major places in the war, he still didn't do enough to secure victory for his homeland, letting down not only his state, but also himself. Lasting Impressions on the World After Robert E. Lee died in September of 1870, he left the lasting impression on the world that would have him remembered to this day. One such contribution that he is remembered by is that his residence was turned into a museum, which is located in Virginia near the Arlington National Cemetery. This museum is visited very often by those fond of the Civil War and the former Civil War general. Another one of Lee's legacies on the world are his quotes on war. One such quote is, It is well that war is so terrible, otherwise we should grow too fond of it. This quote today is a great message of reinforcement to people of the horrors and travesties of war and gives reasons as to remain abstinent of such. Robert E. Lee is a significant person in the history of our nation and has a lasting impression on people even today. If the Confederacy won the Civil War, though we live in a nation where the Union has won the Civil War, it can cause some deep speculation when you think of the topic, what would have happened if the Confederates had won the Civil War? This is a very hypothetical question, as there isn't much to go off of since it happened so long ago. However, had they won, instead of us being one United States, we would have split off into two separate countries, one being the United States of America, and the other being the Confederate States of America. Another question created by this is whether slaves would still be relevant today. With our developments of technology and culture, we have a completely different lifestyle today that eliminates the need for slaves. Also, with development in other countries, would the people in the South have isolated themselves from the rest of the world? And besides that, would it have been possible for a nation to prosper as it has, and would we even be able to survive and win the wars we have without being unified? Would our government have developed differently? How many states would be in our country? Unfortunately, we are unable to determine anything for certain, but the endless possibilities are rather intriguing when they are delved into. But because of Robert E. Lee and the Confederacy losing, we are not faced with these challenges that could have developed with a different outcome in the Civil War. And now, our conclusion. In the end, Robert E. Lee impacted our country in many ways, both positive and negative. His influence is still present today, whether it be his words of wisdom or the college he was named after, he is still present in our modern society. No matter his own ideals, he always remained a man loyal to the South and a traitor to our Union.